Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship at Bethlehem this morning. We're so glad to have you with us. Um, I have a lot for community time, so settle in. Uh, first of all, please take a, uh, the opportunity to grab that pew pad on the inner aisle, pass it down, let us know um, that you're here. We'd love to have a record of your attendance. I want to offer a special welcome to those joining us on our live stream as well. I want to remind you that next week is an important week around here. We will have our conference minister joining us. Um, he will offer the uh, message in both our Saturday night and our Sunday morning service, so I hope you'll join us for that. Immediately following our Sunday service, we will take a second shot at the semi-annual congregational meeting. I don't know what three times a year annual meeting is. Work on that later. Um, we're going to vote on our budget. Immediately following worship, please stick around to do that real quick. We need to have a quorum for that, and we were... We had a quorum by the skin of our teeth at the first shot, so please, please plan to stick around for that. Um, immediately following worship today is our newish to Bethlehem luncheon. So if you consider yourself newish around here, we'd love for you to stick around and join us for lunch. Um, you are only seeing the tip of the iceberg about what's happening around here this morning. Um, our children are currently downstairs. Um, last I heard, we had 27 kids registered for February Faith Fest. Um, that's going on uh, downstairs. We've got some volunteers down there as well. Um, we will hear from those children at the very end of worship, so you can look forward to that. Um, I want to let you know that Sharon Burksmeyer, who has served as our uh, office administrator since July, has accepted a full-time position um, at, a, a, uh, at another firm and is going to be leaving us this week. So please offer her thanks for the wonderful work she's done around here. We, have, we will miss her. Um, that means we're going to have adjustments to our church office hours coming up here soon. We'll keep you posted on that, and we will also keep you posted on the next phase of our search to fill that position. Um, let's see. I have some fantastic news to report on behalf of CAGE. It's Congregations Acting for Justice and Empowerment. Um, the mayor this week shared uh, his recommendation al recommended allocations for a number of CAGE priorities. This is going to blow you away, so just hold on to your pew. Um, <laughs> he has... He has allocated $5 million for this year and the next to go to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. He has recommended $10 million to Southwestern Behavioral Health Care. This allocation will help create a new 20-bed residential treatment center as well as offering psychiatric treatment to children who also have an autism diagnosis. You may have heard us refer to this as the dual diagnosis campaign that Cage has been working on for a while. He's also allocated $300,000 to the Crisis Diversion Center at UCS to help those who are having a crisis related to substance abuse or mental health. This program will divert people who might otherwise end up in our hospitals and jail unnecessarily. This is fantastic news serving some of the most vulnerable people in our community, but we need your help to make it a reality. So if you live in the city, please take the time to reach out to your city council members and encourage their support of the mayor's allocations. There will be a link in Emily's edition this week um, with a form letter from CAGE that you can email to your council members. Um, so please look for that. I believe those are all of my announcements to share with you. Um, but I'd like to start our service this morning. Some of you may have heard um, that uh, Pastor uh, Reverend Kevin Fleming, who was the minister at First Presbyterian Church, uh, passed away very suddenly yesterday afternoon. Um, and so I'd like for us to begin this morning by having a prayer for his family and their, the congregation that is meeting uh, today without their pastor of, I think he's been there 25 years. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, we are hurting for our brothers and sisters downtown this morning and the loss that they are absorbing and all of the feelings that go with that. We give you thanks for Pastor Kevin's life and the so, so many people that he touched and the ways that he served this community tirelessly working for justice. God, loss is never easy, but is compounded when it is so sudden and unexpected. And we don't even know what to pray. We are without words, but we know to pray. 
And so we bring Kevin's family to you today and his church family and the community that will miss him so much. And we offer them up to you, asking that you might comfort and heal the brokenness that is being experienced by his absence today and will be in the days to come. We know that you are close to the brokenhearted and that we are relying on today. We pray these things in the name of the one who has lived among us and has known human grief. It's in him we put our hope and trust, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Sing and rejoice this Saturday. as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law they meditate day and night. May we all be like trees. Please be seated. <coughs> we'll be reading from Luke 10, 38 through 42 this morning. <coughs> now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, 
You are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God. Amen. We can be vulnerable and honest with one another, right? Okay, well, I'll tell you something about myself that I am not particularly proud of. There have been times in our marriage, especially early on, when I would use the increased decibel of my tidying as a signal to communicate that I could use a little assistance. When I was loud cleaning, 
Mike would know that I felt like I was entitled to some help and that that was his cue to hurry and pitch in. When I read our text for this morning, I imagine Martha's many tasks being especially loud. And yet Mary was not picking up her cues. Martha needs help and she feels unseen. Those are terrible feelings to have, compounded by the fact that the one who should understand the need of help and the one she should be able to count on is not jumping up to share the burden. When she finally gives voice to her frustration, Martha skips addressing Mary altogether. Instead, she pleads with Jesus. Mary's selfishness and transgressions are so glaring that surely Jesus will side with her and admonish Mary to get up and do something. But of course, that's not what happens. Now, in my view, Martha can be excused for her misunderstanding. After all, this story comes on the heels of Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. You remember that one, don't you? A Jewish traveler falls into the hands of thieves and is left for dead when a Samaritan, Jews and Samaritans did not get along, when a Samaritan stopped and helped him and paid for his extended care at an inn. Now Jesus tells this story in response to a question raised by a lawyer. Does anyone remember that question? Did I hear it? Might have. Who is my neighbor? Right? The lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells this story that has become, you know, common language for helping, right? Being a good Samaritan. So Jesus tells this story, continues his journey, and the very next thing Luke reports is that Martha welcomes him into her home and begins frantically attending to the many neighborly acts of hospitality. It sounds to me like she's doing exactly what Jesus was advocating for. But instead of being commended for her neighborliness, Jesus sides with Mary when Martha breaches hospitality protocol and puts her guest on the spot. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. Martha expresses frustration that the labor that should be shared is falling all on her. Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken from her. Now, we don't get to hear how these women reacted to the words of Jesus. Did Mary look at her sister smugly? Did Martha raise a protest? Or maybe Mary patted the floor next to her invitationally, inviting Martha to join her. I wonder if Martha exhaled a sigh of relief and let go of all that burdened her. We don't get to know if dinner ever got made or if Jesus and the disciples had to resort to ordering takeout. We don't get to know what happens next. Five short verses tell this story, and those verses fail to answer all of our questions. But there's still a lot to unpack here. First, sitting at the feet of a teacher is a posture of discipleship. We can imagine an elementary school classroom where the children gather on the rug as the teacher teaches from her rocking chair. Sitting at the feet of a rabbi was a spot most often, if not exclusively, inhabited by men. Mary is bold to take her place there. And she is bold to maintain her place, even while Martha loud cleans in the next room. And Jesus is a feminist to defend her place there and intimate that Martha could join her as well. Jesus defends Mary's choice to sit and learn against anything that might threaten that choice. Martha's objections, cultural expectations, or the work piling up in the kitchen. 
Second, the translation from Greek to English loses some critical meaning here that I want to share with you. Now, I promise that I try to shield you all from discussions of original languages. Because I know that's not everybody's cup of tea. But this one's really important, so bear with me. Better yet, pull out your pew Bibles and follow along. We are in Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 38. If somebody gets the page number, you can shout it out. We'll give everybody a shortcut. Seventy-two. Mike, you win the sword drill today. In English, we read, but Martha was distracted by her many tasks. But the Greek is literally, but Martha was being distracted about much service. Again, our English translation says, my sister has left me to do all the work by myself. And the Greek, the sister of me, alone, me left to serve. In both instances, we find the Greek word diakonia, which means to serve. It's where we get the word deacon, diakonia, service, ministry. Martha is busy serving and wants Mary to join her in serving, and Jesus says no. This is startling. Jesus tells Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Now we must note that Jesus does not say Mary has chosen the only part. Service is crucial to the work of the kingdom that he is bringing, but it's not the most important part. It's not even the better part. Mary has chosen that by sitting at Jesus' feet. Now this is puzzling to our 21st century American way of life. Did Jesus really just say sitting around listening and talking theology was the better part? If you're like me, you're wondering who is going to get dinner ready? And will Jesus see things differently when stomachs start grumbling and there's nothing to eat? More broadly, in our culture, we are all about the end game. We look at the words of scripture and read about what we are supposed to do as Christ's disciples, and we want to get right to it. We throw those things on our already overpopulated to-do lists, and we start formulating a plan. If the goal is feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, or making sure children have gifts at Christmas, we will organize, donate, make a plan, work out logistics, and get her done. And we will get more efficient with each passing year until we can almost make it happen in our sleep. We will work it into our calendars right between walking at the mall, taking our kid to oboe practice, and visiting the grandkids up north next weekend. But this better part, this sitting with Jesus, enjoying his company, learning from him, this is more challenging to us. We struggle to sit still. The twin idols of productivity and efficiency make simply sitting in God's presence seem almost wasteful. It is an extravagance to have the time to sit at Jesus' feet. In John's gospel, John reports this same Mary wasting expensive perfume by anointing Jesus' feet. You remember how Judas protested? Why was this perfume not sold and the money given to the poor? Jesus defended Mary there too. The kingdom Jesus is bringing is not about what the kingdoms of this world are about. And so sometimes we get caught up in applying the values of the kingdom we live in day in, day out to the things Jesus has called us to. We want to streamline and squeeze the potential out of every single moment of our lives. But that is not the way God's kingdom works. In God's kingdom, the better part is sitting with Jesus. 
In God's kingdom, the better part is the extravagant love behind the use of the expensive perfume. Questions of efficiency, practicality, and utility go unmentioned in God's kingdom. I came across a commentator this week who asked rhetorically, who would not sympathize with Martha, reduced to the drudgery of service while her sister enjoys the excitement of theological discussion with Jesus? And I just wasn't sure I agreed that all Christians would choose to sit at Jesus' feet rather than scurry around in the kitchen. Would we choose to be serving in the kitchen or sitting there quietly listening? I'm not sure. We are so addicted to the rush of getting things done, checking things off our list, being useful, that sometimes I fear we've lost the plot of this whole life of faith thing. Sometimes I fear that we lose track of our why. Why do we serve the community? Why do we serve the church? Why does the church exist? Are we also being distracted about much service like Martha? Friends, we can be vulnerable and honest with one another, right? Too often I fail to choose the better part. I get caught up in all that needs to be done around here. I worry about much service, meetings, key volunteer positions that need to be filled, staff positions that are open, and all that's falling between the cracks because of those vacancies, and so much more. And sometimes, if I'm not careful, it becomes tempting to loud clean as I find myself scurrying around trying to do what I can to stand in the gaps. The American church has embraced an American ethic of busyness and productivity that I fear, I fear impedes our attention to the Holy Spirit. We want to be useful, but Jesus wants us to sit and listen a while. Remember our why. After all, it's our why that strengthens us for diaconia, for service, for even for much service. Jesus tells us that learning and listening are more important than our to-do list of chores, even chores meant for the good of the kingdom. And when we return to the service we are also called to do, we will be strengthened and empowered by the work that that attentiveness at the feet of Jesus affords us. Five short verses. That's all our text is for today. Five verses, two sisters, one disagreement, and a great big challenge to all of us. But within this challenge is an invitation to liberation. Jesus doesn't tell Martha to keep on working so Mary can be his student. We hear invitation in his gentle, Martha, Martha. You feel free to insert your own name there. And we remember that his yoke is easy and his burden light. Mary, Martha, you, and me, we're all invited to take the posture of disciple and spend time learning from Jesus. Okay, friends, this passage shook me this week while I was studying it. And so I want to share with you something I'm planning to do for Lent, which is now about a month away. And I hope you'll want to be a part of it with me. I want to call it the better part. And during Lent each day, I plan to make and post a five to ten minute video of just talking through a scripture passage, much like I did last week during our snow day worship from home. Will you commit with me this Lent to spend some additional time learning from our scripture together? open to how the Holy Spirit might be speaking to us. I'll share more about that, this as we get closer, but I hope that you'll make plans to join me as we choose the better part this coming Lent. Thanks be to God. Amen.
As we turn our attention now to prayer, I'd like to share several items with you uh, on our prayer list. First of all, you'll see that we have a couple of flowers here on our altar this morning. Uh, the white rose is in memory of member Marjorie Tyler, who passed away February 10th. Um, Marjorie's services will be on Tuesday. Um, there's visitation from 2 to 6 at Alexander West, and the service will be at 6 o'clock um, at Alexander as well. Uh, Marjorie was the mother of Diana uh, Roche, grandmother of Leslie Allen and Erica Dom, great-grandmother of Isabella and Lily Allen, Lily Allen, Paisley, Oliver, and William Dom. Uh, so we continue to pray for their family during this time. And you'll also notice there's a red rose on the altar, and that is in celebration of the birth of Giovanna Lucille Nero, who was born on Thursday, February 3rd, to parents Elizabeth and Zach Nero. Most importantly, of course, Gia's grandparents are Debbie and Phil DeLong. We celebrate with them. Uh, we want to be in prayer for Dottie Feaster, who is recovering from a fall, uh, Sarah Lone, who is recovering from COVID, um, J.P. Parker, who is a student of Will Walls, uh, we also want to be in prayer for Dwight Markwell, who was diagnosed with liver cancer this week. We want to remember him and Barbara in our prayers during this time. Uh, Dwight is currently at um, Barnes in St. Louis, so um, please encourage you to reach out to Barbara this week and let her know that we're thinking of them. Um, I believe those are all of our prayer concerns for this morning. I'm sure that each of you has brought others that are on your heart as well. I have one more here I had right here on my list, and I just didn't mention it. I'm sorry. Uh, we're also also been asked to pray for peace uh, in the growing conflict between uh, Russia and the Ukraine. So we continue to pray for peace there and in other parts of our world as well. Let us go now to God in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this day and for the privilege that it is to gather here together to offer you our worship. We thank you for the story of Mary and Martha. We thank you that you have told us that the better part does not require us running ourselves to death, but that the better part is to be attentive to you and from there to the things you call us to. But God, even as we thank you for that, sometimes we find it frustrating because there are so many problems in this world, so many challenges before us, that if we could fix them by sheer willpower, by scurrying, by working, if we could fix them by the love in our hearts for those who bear so much pain, we would do it in a heartbeat. But God, there's so much outside of our control. There's grief and illness There's international problems that we can't touch. And so when we come to the end of our Martha-ing, we realize that no matter how hard we work and how hard we try, there's so much outside of our grasp. And so we bring this all to you where we should have come from the start. We lift up to you these problems that are so much bigger than us. And we ask that where there is grief, you might bring comfort. Where there is illness, you might bring healing. Where there is despair, that you might bring a way forward. where there is emptiness, that you might pour your love out. We thank you that you give us community, 
We thank you for friends and family and church family that walk alongside us when we are faced with difficulties. And so that even when we don't know what to do, we know that we can unite our hearts and our voices to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. And so we do that now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Anybody see any children back there? All right, well, hold tight. I'm going to peek out the other door here. Children are supposed to be joining us. <laughs> Melinda, would you mind to run down and see? Thank you. Oh, somebody said I could preach a little while longer. I'm sure that's what you all want. <laughs> we'll wait just a minute. Anybody got a hymn request or something? <laughs> you got Jesus Loves the Little Children back there? No, not, on me, no. not on you. <laughs> Good try. Yeah, Wayne, can you lead us in that a cappella? done. summoned you. <laughs> Alright. Why don't we go ahead and do our closing hymn and if they're not here, we'll do Amazing Grace and then if we're not here, we'll hear from them next week. Alright. Please join us for our closing hymn, which doesn't close. Don't go anywhere. My...
please be seated. fun this morning. Thank you for giving us a few extra minutes to get ourselves together. They have worked hard and played hard and learned a little too, I think. So we have some songs that we um, practiced this morning that we want to sing for you. Okay, we're going to do
much for giving us the kids today, and they were just a joy to be with. So thank you so much. And I'll turn it back to Emily. Kids, that was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And those messages are so important. If we could all just be careful with what we hear and see and do, we would be a much better world, wouldn't we? Um, I wondered, I'm going to light this candle here. And I also, while I'm thinking about it, Wayne, you think the choir could do a song where they stood up and sat down? When the... <laughs> that was, you guys are spry up and down like that. My goodness. I'll put that on there. Challenge gold. All right. Uh, Ella, will you carry this out for us here? Boys and girls, I'm going to let you go ahead and find your parents. And why don't we sing a verse of, of Amazing Grace on our way out? Well, let Ella go first. Whoa, hold on. All right. There we go. Everybody just stay seated. We'll let these kids find their moms and dads. you have heard the good news this morning go from this place prepared to share it with all you meet in the name of God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit go in peace amen